Yes, thank you. Um, last May, I had the um, invitation to eat lunch for a day at our schools. And I started off at Ingalls, and I ended up at Classical. Um, and what I saw in the elementary schools is, and I, and I think I ate with kindergartners in Ingalls, is they ate their food. They liked their food. The teachers are very hands-on. They couldn't open their food. So I think we need to make sure that if we're going to have our students eat, eat, eat independently and eat nutritionally, we have to provide them with a meal that is user-friendly. That was my first observation. The cafeteria workers, it was a flawless system. My kitchen does not run a school as the cafeterias across the city. It was flawless. The children were all engaged with how they, they, they ate their meals. I went on to the middle school and the secondary, and I can make that brief. It's because they have a la carte, um, so they have choices. In our elementary schools, they have choices, but sometimes choices are in the classroom and they're rushed. In us adults, they have choices. So we need to find a system that's better in our elementary schools. We have fresh fruits going in, but we don't have what you see at wrap around. I would like nutrition to be wrapped around what the students are eating. If you want to prepare something that's new, can't we have it all reliable for the students so that we know they're eating? I know it can work. Daughter and I have sat on the health and wellness committee two, three, four times over the last several years that we've worked together. So we know ideas work. And honestly, Chatwell, who we have all voted unanimously to service our lunch programs, does maintain the requirements. They just have to be helped with the cliche of stepping out of the box and seeing how we can better appeal to the elementary school's children. Thank you, Patricia. Our next question begins with Mary ESL, or English as a Second Language classes, are essential for new residents in order for them to achieve financial stability, be able to interact with and become an integrated part of their community. Yet, Operation Bootstraps ESL program has a waiting list of over 800 people, and the Ford School's ESL program has had to turn away some parents of students as they are beyond the classroom capacity. What do you propose to increase access to these programs to address this wide need? Two years ago, um, we opened up an high school that I would attack Charlie Gell and myself on the committee, and we worked with the North Shore Labor Council because we knew there was a, uh, an overabundance of candidates um, with Operation Bootstraps and they couldn't handle it. Um, 
I think obviously this year we expanded this to high school a little lot there. But if there's a need, that we will serve that need down at Lynn Tech with the night school program. I also think to make it more convenient, they should actually pop up uh, night school courses in the neighborhood schools so that people don't have to travel and have problems uh, getting from one part of the city to another. We go to their neighborhood schools and, um, and take these courses. But I, I really think we have an obligation to reach out and, and help the communication of the people in the city as best we can. Just a moment, Stanley. I'd like you to address this with uh, the information that the ESL classes and the classes at Lynn Tech, as opposed to the first year um, that was done with the New Brooklyn Coalition, they are now, if I just checked today, $50. Um, and at least the majority of the people who need these classes have over a 75% chance of being able to take the bottom line. So $50 or $100 from mom and dad is and that, and that is something we addressed right from the beginning uh, that was brought up by Jeff Brodby and the Ontario Labor Council. And in some of the cases, I suggested a fee up front that be reimbursed at the completion of the course. And the only reason I suggested an upfront fee was because if the course has no value to people, then they might come when they want to come. But I, I, there should be no cost to someone that wants to take that course. Again, we suggested an upfront fee just to show that the, the program itself had some value and to get the people that come. But we have made a stipulation that anybody that came every week or almost every week should be fully reimbursed at the end of the program. Thank you, John. Stanley. Uh, how many elementary schools did they say there was in the city? 18. How many are closed most of the day? There is your space problem. Uh, and I don't know, uh, there is a question of you could use Title I money, I'm not sure that um, you might have to uh, you know, argue really well with that, but you could use Title I money to pay for the uh, teachers and because uh, there is a certain percentage of Title I money that has to, to be spent on parents, 10%, I think it's uh, about 600000 But uh, a little paying one teacher could teach you know, 20 adults. And you know, if the adults learn the language better, then they can read to their kids, they can help their kids with, with this. Um, yeah, if, you know, as for how well tech is working, the waiting list is current, right? It's 1,800 now, after they've opened tech. Or, so uh, that alone is not the answer. You know, we need more, and the cost is prohibitive. Um, yeah, they, they shouldn't have to pay for this. Mr. Stauber. Dr. Crane and the Ford School has been, uh, I guess, pioneers with uh, ESL in the city of Lynn and addressing the needs of those that, that need to learn English. And, and as everybody well knows, Operation Bootstrap does uh, a tremendous job, uh, has a tremendous backlog. Now, we have some of the other schools, the level four schools started offering ESL uh, programs as well as, as what was opened up to tech. But uh, I'm a member of uh, Grace United Methodist Church on Broadway. And one of the things that the, the congregation wanted to do was find out what the community needs that they could, could help out with. And um, my church has contacted Operation Bootstrap. We have an educational wing with some classrooms in that facility. And now uh, our rooms there are open up a couple of nights a week running ESL programs. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done within our, our church buildings. There are many organizations that are within the city, you know, whether it's a faith-based organization or, or other, um, that would love to help. So what we need to do is is involve more of the community um, and, and look, you know, somebody used the, the, the catchphrase, uh, think outside the box a little bit, but that's something that can, can definitely be done. There's a lot of space, a lot of open space uh, every night of the week and, and varied hours as well. I think uh, Connery was doing their programs uh, during the day because 
they knew a lot of the parents who needed that help were, were working during the, working at night. Um, so there's many different ways that, that we can address it, but I think we need to, to expand our web a little bit as, as we solicit help. Mr. Gallo. Thank you. So I think we can all agree education is first and foremost about the student, but it has to be also about the parent and it has to be about the family because parental involvement is so key and family involvement is so key when we talk about providing a quality education here in Lynn. As I said earlier, I support evening programs, help with English, excuse me, English language, help with GED, and help with job training for our parents and families. Um, you mentioned Operation Bootstrap. Uh, my friend Ann Carrigan, who's the, the uh, Board of Directors President at Operation Bootstrap, she and her husband uh, rent office space to me and I set up a couple of weeks ago a meeting with Ann and with the superintendent. So I think coming to a, a Lynn item story near you in the next couple weeks, you'll see uh, Operation Bootstrap in our schools, which is great. Um, again, with John Ford, I worked on opening up Lynn Tech at night, worked with the New Lynn Coalition and the North Shore Labor Council um, to offer various educational and training opportunities there at night. And I do want to say that John Ford's really been a champion of keeping the costs down at that program. It's not free to open up a school at night. We have to cover the costs somehow. John has really advocated to bring costs down um, in the various programs. On the early literacy program, we have a grant writer trying to help us bring that cost down so that students can go in and get help with their, their early literacy needs um, at little to no cost. I think we need to keep continuing to offer those programs and keep trying to fund them in ways that make it affordable for everyone. Thank you. Ms. Karaska. Yes, um, my purpose always has been, it always going to be to have a pre open. The school building should be open for us to address the issues that we have as a parents, as a community resident in that city. Um, we need to address those issues because we see parents that they want to be involved. How do you expect a parent to be involved if they don't speak that English? How do you expect somebody to be involved if, with the education of the children if they are not able even to communicate with teachers? We need more community school as far as school as everybody said. Uh, and people keep mentioning the lead tech with the placement program. I'm talking about I am the she of the new link coalition. And we decide that many parents, as a Wendy says, can afford to pay a hundred dollars, cannot afford to pay seventy-five dollars, fifty dollars, and we pay for them as a ruling coalition. We pay the parents to go up to attend the uh, uh, little classes that was for six weeks, and we it's not enough. We need a school to be open, and yes, we should involve the politicians, the, the all official elected should be involved because a city who have no education, parents who have no education and don't can, they are not able to help the students, the city is never going to progress. So we should involve the politicians in these issues in our city. They are part of the solution also. They, they want us to work for them. Um, I have to say that working with poor school is amazing. I've been sending parents to the church, as you said. I am also a member of Operation Muslim, and yes, the school should make a, a partnership with Operation Muslim because they know better how to address those issues about English as a second language and also GED. Thank you. This is Romani, hello. There's so many answers to this question. First of all, um, I think it would be important to find out where our biggest areas of needs are as far as, far as where the most numbers of parents uh, who are looking for ESL services and target those areas. Um, I think we will need more community partnerships. We have a huge community here in Lynn that is full of not only space but volunteers. Um, I'm thinking, the, Rick mentioned the churches, not just the churches, but we have tons of after school programs for our kids, everything from the Boys and Girls Club, the Salvation Army, the Lions Day, the Great House, World Saint, Center Board. All of those places have space. Maybe they can donate the space. Maybe we can donate the volunteers. Maybe we organize it and, collab and, and, and form these collaborations and form our parents, and we get the volunteers from somewhere else. My best friend works at GE, and he was telling me about an email that went around all the GE employees looking for volunteers in the school. Do you know only two schools asked for volunteers from GE? Two. 
two, Druids, kill. We are not collaborating enough with our community. We're not asking them for help. We're not partnering with them enough. We have the space, we have the people, we can take care of this. We even have the funds. Title I money. A lot of schools use their Title I money for um, reading specialists, librarians. They get to choose on where their money goes. Schools like the Ford School, and I saw Dr. Payne walking around, so correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Payne, but she actually eliminated one position here at the school to fund her after school programs as far as the night school goes. We could do that too. We could utilize money that we wouldn't necessarily think of being as being available. Again, I think it's going to take collaboration. I think we all need to work together to find the money, to find the space, to find the space to teach. Thank you. This is Kabbalah. Yes, thank you. Um, I was sitting here thinking quickly, and, and, I, and I'm thinking of Robin Harrington, Ingalls, and Ford just off the top of my head, and they all sound um, like they're communities that are immersed, uh, school communities that are um, immersed in several language, and so several language barriers. But those schools are running the ESL programs for parents, and I think someone had mentioned they are being run at um, convenient times for parents. We have worked a volunteer program over the summer over at Centerwood, and they too are running ESL programs morning, noon, and night. Well, I think what we need to do, we have United Way. They too are running, um, collaborating with other nonprofits. There are over 20 nonprofits in the city that are willing and capable of running ESL classes. It's not, it's what we need to do is take the three programs I mentioned, Two programs mentioned to the left, three programs mentioned to the right, and somehow let people know, even if it's on a flyer that goes to every school in need, where these programs are. Because I know I sat there all summer, and those programs were not filled. So we need to reach out, and maybe it's a school year that parents might need, but with the programs there, we want people to fill those programs. We want the community to get together and reach out to our parents. It'll be said all night. Our parents are the first target. Baby. Your children are yours. We want you to be the lead educator. So if you can speak the language, we are far more dependent on that than you are to be dependent on that. It's a partnership that language cannot be our first barrier. So an ESL program in schools is something that schools are willing. And if it's not in a certain school, then we as a committee need to know which school Probably should host one. Thank you, Mrs. Capone. Mrs. Capone. Well, this, this subject is dear to me. Um, my mother's parents and all of their children came from Poland many, many years ago. And I remember my grandfather went out to work, so it was easier for him to pick up the English language than my grandmother, who stayed home. And she really struggled with it. So um, I know it was, it was difficult. And uh, we don't want anybody here um, to have that same problem. All these services should be here for the parents who want to um, go out and learn the English. Um, number one, there should be no fee or no or any cost to be able to have um, English as a second language classes at all. Another um, agency that wasn't mentioned is New America inside the Blood Building. And uh, they also have ESL classes. But, um, you know, the other thing is, I think it is the school department's responsibility. And I know that, um, you know, we need to change the mindset of some of our administrators who do not think that it is that important to offer the ESL. Um, and that's done, you know, at the top of the superintendent. She, um, you know, it's been a struggle here when Dr. Crane has used that Title I money for those classes. But that Title I money, when you use it to educate the parents and help them along so they can help their kids, it's a good use of money. And um, I think that um, it's really important that she, she be able to continue using your Title I money, money for that, as well as we talked to other principals parents need them in the school and they also use them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Donna. In the interest of time, we've been asked to go straight to closing remarks.
having no fundraisers because I want to give an objective voice, an objective view to what's going on in our schools. Um, on November 5th, I'd like one of your six of us. Thank you very much. John. Hi, uh, I am a candidate for re-election in my seventh term on the Lynn School Committee. I take the position very seriously and I firmly believe that every child in Lynn is equally entitled to the best educational opportunity that we can provide in a safe and welcoming environment. Over the past three years as Chairman of Building and Grounds, I've been part of an effort with the Mass State Building Authority to retain funding for a new Marshall Middle School. We will soon be breaking ground for that new school. We have a new Pickering School in the MSBA pipeline, and I hope that this is the start of an accelerated build plan for several new badly needed schools. Last week, Mr. Gallo and I were in Pickering with State Treasurer Grossman, a sketch of assessing that school for replacement. I have a master's degree in education and over 30 years of business management experience as my qualifications as a school committee member. I also have two daughters that are Lynn teachers who keep me aware of what's happening in the system. I think that the current committee will all agree that the Lynn schools are doing well. Connery and Harrington were just upgraded to level three status. We have no level four schools in Lynn. Classical and Lynn Woods achieved level one status. We now have six schools at level one status. Status Of the nine commissioners in urban districts, Lynn, Lynn ranks number one in ESL and science, and number two in math. I think these are major accomplishments in a very diverse school system of over 14,000 students. But we have issues. We have a critical need for classroom space. This is what necessitated the move of the kindergarten to commercial street. The shortage of space makes it very difficult to add new teachers, reduce class size, and this includes much needed features at school libraries. If I am, with object, if I am elected, my primary motivator it will be to seek out additional facilities for classroom use and to assure a reasonable class size. Thank you, Number John. three on the ballot, John, please thank consider you. me born of your boss. Lorraine. Hi, my name is Lorraine Gailey, and I'm running for Lynn Public School Committee. And I'm doing this because I just retired from Pickering Middle School as a lead teacher in science. I've taught in Lynn Public Schools for 33 years. I want to represent the teachers, the students, the parents, because I have been one of all of them here in Lynn Public Schools. There's nobody here that cares more than this, about the students than me, and I have several students out here that know that. I will work my butt off for you. I will work so hard. I will find solutions to the problems that were brought to us today. Um, I would like to see more respect between the super, school committee, principals, and teachers. That's what I would really like. I run my classroom that way. Everybody shows respect for one another. We care about one another. We show respect for one another. And we put our hand out when one another needs help. And that's what I would like to see for Lynn Public Schools. I want it to be like my students in my classroom call my classroom Gateway's World. I want to see Lynn Public Schools as a place of respect where everyone is going to learn. So you have trusted me for 33 years with your child. Please trust me with one of your six votes on November 5th. Fifth. And I'm number five. Think about it. Five, five. You know that five dollar thing. Foot long. I'm number five on the ballot. So please vote for me. Thank, Thank you, Lauren. Donna. My name is Jonica Bowler, and I would like one of your six votes to send me back to the school committee. I want to say first that you've been an excellent audience. I cannot believe how still you have sat for all of this, and I appreciate it. Uh, my daughter teaches here at Ford, and she tells me the kids here at Ford are fantastic. 
they're well behaved, they, hear, they come here to learn, and Dr. Uh, Crane expects that of them and expects a lot from the teachers. So um, I must say, as I see that you all sitting like this, I understand now that my, my daughter says, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So your kids are um, a good example of you. Um, the important thing is, if you send me back, I will at every school committee meeting, as I have for uh, the last number of years, I'll ask the tough questions at the table. I won't be able, won't be afraid to ask them. I won't be afraid um, to get answers for you. And um, I think it's an important thing, and I want you to send to that this school committee when we meet in January and get sworn in a group of people that are going to work really hard for your kids. Thank you. Just don't forget. Thank you. Patricia. Thank you again. Thank you for hosting this evening, and thank you for being the audience that you were to take the time and energies to listen to us as candidates for school committee. Ultimately, my mission is to be part of a committee whose goals is to continuously improve your students' social, cultural, and academic achievements, and to provide all students with skills, knowledge, and experience to achieve success as young adults. I want the community to raise students adults. Sixteen years ago when I ran, my mission and my passion hasn't changed. I entered the school committee race because I was an advocate for my son. My son entered because he had lots of needs. He had medical needs, he had um, academic needs. But that hasn't changed for me. I know very well small struggles and great gains for your students. I have had the vision, I have had the experience of good committees, I have had committees that work together, I have committees that have been Polarized. I have been able to orchestrate staying in the middle of the committee. I can be a voice of reason. I am well versed in the needs of the Lynn Public School System. I am well versed in the needs of our buildings and what quality <coughs> education looks like. I ask you to please send me back as a candidate for the Lynn School Committee this election. Thank you. Listen. My name is Liz Romanella, uh, and I'm lucky number seven on the ballot. And uh, I want all of your votes. I want your vote, I want your mom's vote, I want your dad's vote, your brothers, your sisters, and all your friends. I cannot wait to be sitting on the school committee next to Donna Coppola asking the hard questions. You think she asked the hard questions? You ain't seen nothing yet. I got to sit on the budget hearing, and I saw Donna ask Kevin McHugh, where did you come up with that figure? What, why is that in there? Kevin goes, that's what I was told it would be there. That's not gonna why next year. We're not going to keep doing this year after year after year. I watched the school committee take $250,000 away from special education and give it to make new administrative jobs. You want to talk about money for ESL? You want to talk about money for reading programs, librarians, and reading specialists? Our administration was sitting in a school building. Our administration was sitting in classrooms. They had chalkboards in their offices. Enough is enough. I want to be your fourth vote. Not just your vote, everyone you know's vote. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Now I think I speak for everyone here who gave their time to come speak to you. Please vote on November 5th. Thank you again to our hosts at the Ford School. The candidates and I thank you all for coming. All the students can go up to their classroom. This is Wendy Joseph for the Highland School. Thank you.